Perfect. So thank you so much uh, for joining in um, and uh, checking with us today. My name is Andrea, as Emily introduced before, and I am joined with my coworker Sam today. We're social distancing, um, and so we'll kind of take turns being on camera today. But we're really excited to be with you uh, this morning because we're going to show you animals that we get to work with every single day. And I always say that we have the best job because we get to work with the animals, but we also get to work with the people. And as educators, we get to visit classrooms, we get to visit um, with families, and we get to share um, all the knowledge that we have about the animals and our passions uh, for these guys. We're going to be showing you our um, education animal ambassadors today, um, which are great because they're an animal that you don't normally get to see when you come to the zoo. And they're small so that we can um, kind of have them in hand if we want to. And today we're going to kind of show them um, in a more natural state. So you get to see them being animals um, and we get to talk about really great things. So um, you're here to see animals and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to step off camera and Sam is going to come in and uh, we're going to talk about our first animal and we're going to have a lot of fun today. Hi you guys and welcome. My name is Sam and I'm also an educator here at Reed Park Zoo and I'm going to show you guys um, one of our first and one of our smallest animal ambassadors. So, and you can actually probably hear it right now, but this is a Madagascar hissing cockroach and you can probably hear her signature hissing right now. So Madagascar hissing cockroach um, are found on the island of Madagascar. And with these animal ambassadors, we usually use them for teaching about um, different habitats. So here at Reed Park Zoo, we have several pro different programs that teachers can choose when learning about these different animals. And so one of those is learning about habitats. And so we like to use these guys to teach about rainforest habitats and the importance of rainforest and the importance that cockroaches have in rainforest habitats. Um, so these guys are really, really important decomposers, um, meaning that they love to eat rotten fruits and vegetables and leaves that fall on the floor in the rainforest. Um, so these guys are really important for keeping forests clean. They're also a really important source of protein in the rainforest. Now, of course, when you're a cockroach, you don't want to be an important source of protein for another animal. Um, and so that's why you hear that hissing sound for these cockroaches. So what these cockroaches like to do is you can kind of see that smooth um, shape. They will go in big family groups and they will squeeze their way under rocks or under tree bark, and they're gonna hide in big, big groups. So if an animal or a predator who wants to eat these cockroaches um, comes to try to find one, um, if they rip open that bark or if they lift that rock, they're gonna have uh, several hundred of these cockroaches all hissing at them at the same time. So that's a really good way to deter predators. Now this hissing sound, if you were to make a hissing sound, it would be coming from your mouth. But from these cockroaches, the hissing sound actually comes from these little holes called spiracles. And you can kind of see the spiracles here on the abdomen. So there's these kind of dark spots. Oh, she is a very gregarious cockroach. You can see these spots on the abdomen. And that's how the cockroaches breathe. And that's also how the cockroaches make their hissing sound is by pushing air through those spiracles. Now here at Reed Park Zoo, once again, these are very, very small animals. And we like to also emphasize the importance of taking care of animals here at the zoo. So our cockroach colonies, we have two different species of cockroaches. We have these Madagascar hissing cockroaches, and we also have giant cave cockroaches. They all live in our conservation learning center. These guys generally are going to stay behind the scenes. Um, and we take very, very good care of them. They also, they get, um, they get checked every day to make sure that they are healthy and doing well. And they also um, get plenty of food and fresh water and clean habitats to make sure that they have healthy lives. They can even get checked um, by a veterinarian if that's necessary and see, make sure they don't have any health issues. So we take very, just as good of care of our hissing cockroaches as we do um, our elephants and zebras and other large animals. Um, if you look closely, I might, might want to point, I'm going to point this out uh, that you might be able to see on top of her head, um, those little dots moving around. 
those are actually really cool too. And we like to talk about those with our guests um, as those are little tiny mites. They're tiny, tiny microscopic animals and they actually live on and with these cockroaches. So when a lot of people see cockroaches, they kind of think, ew, that is a cockroach. Um, but the cockroach is like, ew, a human is touching me. And those little mites are gonna clean all the little oils and dirts that get on the cockroach. So these cockroaches are actually very, very clean animals. They clean themselves, but they have little friends who live on them and with them to help keep them clean as well. Um, also with our cockroaches, um, what we talk about is biomimicry. So one thing that we teach um, kids at school is about biomimicry, which is basically when humans take inspiration from animals to invent things. So the cockroach, once again, has that really cool shape that allows it to squeeze into places that not a lot of other animals would be able to squeeze into. And we've actually invented robots um, that have that same shape and can actually mimic the movements of cockroaches. And we use those robots, like if there's a lot of debris or some sort of disaster, they are very small robots. They can squeeze into tight places with cameras so that they can help find uh, survivors in those debris. So we have a lot of really cool things to be able to teach people about these really, really cool and interesting animals. Now, Andrea is going to come back and she's going to have an animal to show you guys as well. All right, so here I am um, and I have a different animal. So this is a snake and both the cockroach and snakes um, they're very important uh, for the jobs that they do in the environment um, and that um, is that snakes are predators. So their job is to control rodent populations. Now this snake here in my hands, this is a Trans-Pecos rat snake. And so Trans-Pecos rat snake, they're not native to our desert here, the Sonoran Desert. They're actually from a neighboring desert, the Chihuahua Desert. So it's parts of Mexico, Texas, and New Mexico. Um, what I really love about this snake is the coloring and the pattern. So if you can imagine being out, um, you know, taking a hike maybe in, on a desert trail, um, and you think about what the color of the ground looks like, her pattern and her colors are really gonna help her camouflage or blend into that environment. It's gonna be really hard to see her. That's gonna be really important because that's gonna keep her safe from predators that might wanna eat her. Um, birds of prey, coyotes, um, other animals that are kind of hanging out looking for a treat. Um, they might think of a snake as, uh, as an animal that they wanna eat. So she's gotta make sure she's staying safe. Um, she's not venomous, um, so she doesn't have any venom or poison in her mouth. Uh, so to protect herself, she's really going to have to rely on that camouflage. Um, the other thing is um, she is going to be hunting uh, rodents primarily. She's a rat snake. Um, so out in the desert, they have a very important job of controlling that rodent population. And so she needs to be able to camouflage so that her food doesn't see her. Because if you're a mouse and you see a snake, you're going to go running away. Uh, and so she needs to be able to kind of hide and wait for her food to come to her. She does have some really cool tools to be able to find her food. Uh, so you saw her kind of flicking out her tongue. And so her tongue there um, she can use kind of like the way we use our nose. So her tongue is forked. It has two pieces to it. So it's got uh, separation. And the tongue is able to collect particles floating in the air. Snakes and um, some other reptiles have a special organ called a Jacobson's organ. And the Jacobson's organ uh, is kind of right in the inside of their mouth. And it helps their brain figure out what they're smelling or what's going on around them. So she has eyes. You can see her eyes are actually quite large. Um, and so her eyes are going to help her um, go hunting, especially at night. Rodents a lot of times are nocturnal, which means they're active and busy in the nighttime hours. Um, so if your food's active at night, you probably want to be active at night as well. Um, and it's also very hot in a desert. And so being active at night um, means that you're not going to have to worry so much about the hot, hot sun. So the snake has very large eyes to help her see a little bit better at night, um, but she can also use that tongue to help her um, find her prey. As I said before, she's not venomous, so she doesn't have any uh, poisons in her mouth. So when she does find a mouse or a rat that she wants to eat, um, they have sharp teeth in their mouth. They are carnivores. So she's gonna grab onto her food uh, with her mouth. It's the only thing that she can really use to grab on things. And then she's gonna wrap her body around it. So this is a constrictor snake. You can 
can see she's actually holding on to my hands pretty well. Um, and so she's got very strong muscles and uh, bones in their body. Um, a lot of people are surprised to hear that snakes have bones, but they actually have more bones in their body than we have in our own uh, bodies. Uh, and their body is more like um, designed like a, a long uh, rib cage. So all of our sensitive organs are right here in our rib cage. They protect our heart and our lungs um, and they provide a nice little uh, kind of cage to keep all those things safe. Snakes have all the same organs that we have. They're just kind of elongated through their body. So they have kind of a long rib cage to kind of protect them. Um, and that gives them great flexibility to be able to bend and turn and curve. And you can see she's kind of turned herself into a little bit of a pretzel right now in my hands. Um, so they're very flexible um, and they're also very powerful with those muscles so they can squeeze their prey uh, nice and tight they can constrict it and uh, when they're ready to eat um, and they feel safe that they're not going to get harmed because if you're a mouse and you're um, in the grasp of a snake uh, you're going to try to run away uh, because that's going to help you stay alive. Um, if you can't get away, then you might try to fight. And as a mouse, you might have sharp teeth, you have claws, and you're going to try to fight uh, for your life. Um, so the snake wants to make sure it's going to be safe for her to eat, and she's going to get a meal that's not going to run away from her. Um, and uh, so she'll open her mouth really wide when she's ready. Um, snakes have extra ligaments here in the middle. So I'm going to see if I can lift up her head just a little bit. And we'll see if you can see there's a ligament right there in the middle. It actually spreads her mouth open sideways. So she's able to kind of spread her mouth. Her jaw is separated into two pieces. So if you take your hand and you feel your bottom jaw, our jaw is all one piece. But for a snake, they have two pieces and there's a ligament that holds them together in the middle. So her mouth can spread open sideways. She also has extra bones at the back of her jaw that allow her mouth to open up and down uh, very wide. So a snake is actually able to swallow their food whole and they kind of engulf their food and those sharp teeth point backwards to pull the food into their mouth. So it's actually really impressive uh, when they eat and they swallow their food whole. And the really um, cool thing about reptiles is their bodies work just a little bit different than mammals um, and different from our bodies. Um, so we have to eat pretty often. We need those calories because it's what keeps our body going. It keeps our heart pumping, gives us the air to breathe and give us our muscle movements. So we have to eat pretty quickly because we're always burning those calories. As a reptile, um, their bodies work just a little bit differently. They're kind of like solar powered animals. So when it's really hot out, um, we see a little bit more reptiles. Now that it's cooling down, um, we're gonna start seeing those reptiles less and less because their bodies slow down to prepare for the cooler temperatures. And um, so they don't have to eat as often. And uh, for a snake uh, like this one here, here at the zoo, she gets two mice every 10 days or so. So if you think about that for 10 days, she doesn't eat. Um, and so that food is digesting in her body. Imagine what it would feel like for you if you went 10 days without eating, you probably get really, really hungry. So bodies work in really unique and different ways. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna set her off to the side and uh, we're gonna answer questions at the very end. Um, so if you do have questions, we encourage you to ask those questions. You can send them to the chat and Emily will kind of record those. And then at the end, we'll promise to take some time to answer those questions. But we're gonna put our Trans-Pecos uh, rat snake away. We're gonna travel to a different desert and I've got another animal friend right here. So excuse my reach. Here we go. So here's another animal friend. And this is a bearded dragon. Now this is one of the few animals that if you do come to the zoo, um, they're part of our animal ambassador collection, but you actually can see them um, in our conservation learning center. Now, right now we have to be safe and um, the conservation learning center is closed for safety reasons. Um, but this animal uh, is um, in there. And so once we open again, um, we invite you to come and uh, look at her. Um, and she is a bearded dragon. These are from Australia. So you can see they get quite large. They're a pretty large uh, sized lizard, but one of the things that you might notice, um, an observation that you might have made between the, the 
Transpagos rat snake and this dragon are the scales. They have rough, tough scales because living in a desert, uh, they wanna make sure that they don't um, have the moisture kind of evaporate from their body. So their scales are a little bit more dry um, and different snakes or different uh, reptiles, if you look at them, their scales might be different if they live in a different kind of environment. Maybe their scales are more smooth um, or soft looking or even slimy looking. Um, and that might reflect where they come from. But this little lizard, this little lizard can actually be found in uh, a variety of habitats. So um, they are found in deserts, but they can also do very well in grasslands and they can also be found in wooded areas. Um, so they get their name bearded dragon because of this beard right in front of her chin there. So right now um, she's pretty calm. We handle these animals a lot. So they're very used to being in hand. Um, so if she was threatened or she felt um, in danger, that beard would actually start to puff out. Uh, so there's a lot of loose skin hanging in and around that area. It's kind of like how we puff up our cheeks. So you can take a second and grab a breath of air and blow up your cheeks. So you can see our, our cheeks can kind of grow up into a bigger size there. And that's gonna, um, make her look a little bit more intimidating. The bigger you are and the more puffed out you are, uh, an animal might think that you're um, a little bit dangerous uh, and they might think twice about uh, kind of getting close to you. Another thing right now you can see her beard is kind of um, flat, but you can see underneath there some darker colors. Those darker colors can actually start to uh, come out and um, show themselves. So she can have some purples and some blacks in there um, to kind of uh, scare off those predators. So when you have a really colorful animal, a lot of times colors in the wild mean dangerous, stay away. What I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna set her down on this uh, platform over here. And we're gonna just kind of see what she looks like just kind of hanging out on a, on a platform. And the reason we're doing this is um, we're gonna get ready for our next animal, uh, but we're gonna have her here and I'll keep talking about her, but I need to move off screen so I can just talk about her. Okay, so I'm gonna leave her there. She's pretty awesome. Now, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in front of the camera there. Uh, bearded dragon, they are um, omnivores, which is a great advantage out in the wild. If you're an omnivore, you're gonna be able to eat a lot of different things. So if there's no plants around, you can eat some animals. And so animals that she might be eating are uh, mice or um, small lizards. She might be eating some insects. And then she also can eat some plants. So hopefully my mouth doesn't get too muddled here. I have to put on a mask um, for our next animal. Um, and so she is going to be um, able to eat a lot of different things. Here at the zoo, we give her kind of a spring mix. She also gets some uh, small uh, bugs a few times a week. So sometimes we'll give her crickets um, and that's an extra special treat because our crickets and our worms are live. So she can actually hunt them in her habitat. Uh, they have excellent, um, they're able to uh, move their eyes independently. So you might've seen her kind of moving her eyes around um, and she can kind of see on both sides of her. So that's gonna help her kind of zero in on that food. And those holes, one of the things we always get asked is what are those holes on the sides of her head? Well, just like we have holes on the sides of our head, those are actually her ears. Uh, and so she can hear, she has an ear structure that's very similar to ours. It's a little bit different uh, because it's a reptile, but she can hear um, with those ear holes there. She does have some pretty good claws so they can kind of climb a little bit into a higher branch to bask in the sun, uh, but they're pretty, pretty calm. Um, and they're just really great animals. One other thing that you might've noticed about the bearded dragon is on the side of her body, she had those spines. So her scales have these modified uh, points on them and they're actually really soft to the touch, uh, but they're there to look intimidating. So if you're an animal and you see those spines, you definitely don't wanna take a bite of her because she's gonna look uh, uh, like a pointy cactus or something sharp that you don't wanna put in your mouth. Uh, so those spines are there to help uh, defend her and protect her. All right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna transition again. So I'm gonna kind of step in front here and we have another animal to show you. All right, you guys. So we have one more animal to show you and talk about today. And that there down here, and it is our ferrets. 
So we have two ferrets here at Reed Park Zoo. Their names are Dimitri and Nadia. And they're here in their little playpen, um, just kind of playing around and doing what ferrets like to do best, which is roll around and look around in tunnels. So this is Dimitri and Nadia. Um, these are domestic ferrets, and domestic ferrets are not actually true ferrets um, like you might see know about in the wild. So in hmm? oh, can you hear can the radio? Oh, that's the radio. Okay. Um, so these are domestic ferrets, and domestic ferrets are actually um, relatives of European pole cats. So they've come here from Europe. We do not have wild domestic ferrets, um, but we do have wild black-footed ferrets in North America. And so we use these guys as an opportunity to teach people um, how ferrets work in the wild, and especially how black-footed ferrets work in the wild. So these guys, as you may have noticed, are very, very agile. So we have lots of tubes and playthings for them to run around with. And that is because, especially in North America, ferrets rely entirely on prairie dogs and prairie dogs live in tunnels. So you need to be able to be very, very flexible to be able to move around in the tunnels of prairie dogs while they're hunting for their food. Black-footed ferrets rely almost completely um, on prairie dogs. It makes over 90% of their diet. And what happened with black-footed ferrets is in the early 1900s, there was actually a prairie dog um, extermination program because they were seen as pests. And what happened was, is when we were kind of exterminating these prairie dogs, um, the ferrets went with them. And so in the 1970s, black-footed ferrets were almost considered extinct by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They eventually did find one population of ferrets of about 100 individuals on a private farm, and they were monitoring those ferrets closely, but um, some diseases went through the colony. So there was plague and there was canine distemper that went through the ferret population, and that population went down to just 18 individuals. Now those 18 individuals were all captured, and they were brought to zoos um, to participate in breeding programs to try to reintroduce the ferrets. Of those 18 individuals, only seven black-footed ferrets were able to breed. But through the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and through the um, breeding programs of five different zoos in the United States, um, we have reintroduced ferrets, uh, black-footed ferrets into the wild. And there are actually, from those seven that were able to breed, there's around 300 wild ferrets in the United States today. So this is just a really cool example of ways that we can teach kids and teach families about the importance of conservation, the work that zoos do for conservation and helping wild animals and wild places. Because even though we had to capture those ferrets, we worked very closely with local fish and wildlife services and game and fish departments to help bring this species back and have them actually breeding and succeeding in the wild. Now with 300 wild ferrets, there's still a lot of work to go but lots of people both um, in Fish and Game um, and Fish and Wildlife Service and in several zoos are working really, really hard to bring this species back from the brink of extinction. And I think that's a really, really cool story. Um, <laughs> they are very playful animals um, and domestic ferrets are just a really cool way to be able to teach about that. If you are interested in helping black-footed ferrets, there are actually volunteer programs through the Arizona Game and Fish Department where you can actually volunteer to help monitor populations of wild black-footed ferrets. And it's a really cool program to participate in if you're ever interested in that. Now ferrets, oh, once again, so <laughs> ferrets are gonna be carnivores. I'll talk a little bit about the ferrets themselves. They're gonna be carnivores. Um, and so, and they're almost exclusively carnivores. Now here at the zoo, we feed them um, a special nutritional diet that's gonna have all the nutrition that they need. And we also feed them a few fruits and vegetables as well because they can have a few fruits and vegetables. Um, so even though they're mostly carnivores, they do benefit from the vitamins and nutrients that can be found in certain fruits and vegetables. And they really do um, enjoy their food. Um, these guys have a lot of energy. So we like to say the parrot, ferrets will play hard and then they'll sleep hard. So after they're done um, hanging out with us and, and playing in their little area here, um, they will probably take a very, very hard nap, very similar if any of you have any cats. And you notice the cats will get the zoomies and then the cats will sleep for several hours. 
It's the same with our ferrets. And sometimes even when we do programs and we have the ferrets in hand, they will actually fall asleep in their hands because they are very used to us handling them and they just feel very relaxed and are happy to take a nap wherever they are able to take a nap. Um, then you might notice that they have little harnesses on them. This is for the ferrets' safety. Um, so if that, um, it's just so that we can keep a better handle on them and make sure that they are safe and healthy and don't, because ferrets um, have a lot of energy and sometimes we'll try to get into places that might not be the safest for them. So it's just to help us be able to keep track of them and to keep them safe and healthy and happy. Yeah, and so now with that, I'm going to zoom back to Andrea. She's going to be wearing her N95 mask because um, for the health and the safety of our ferrets, we wear a lot of personal protective equipment when they're, they're with our ferrets. So she'll wear it while I'm putting them away. Um, and But she'll be here to answer any questions about any of our ambassador animals and especially the ones we have here with us today. All right. Thank you, Sam, for showing us those ferrets. Here I am, and uh, we're gonna kind of refocus here. And again, I'm wearing my N95. It's because we need to protect the ferrets. Um, and so um, as soon as those ferrets uh, are put away, then I can take off my mask. But Emily, did we get any questions through the chat about any of the animals that we talked about today? We sure did. Um, so first question, uh, Snakes are seen less in cold weather, but are snakes or any snakes um, active year round, even though we're seeing them less? Are they off hibernating for the winter or might they still be moving around and being a little active? Yeah, that's a really great question. So they're still around. They're um, just a really, really slow state. Um, and a lot of reptiles go through a, a kind of hibernation. Um, and the name is, oh my gosh, escaping me right now. Brumation, thank you. <laughs> Sam helped me out. Um, and so it's called brumation, um, which is kind of like a reptile version of hibernation. So their bodies just kind of really slow down, um, but they're still around. They're just kind of hiding out, uh, maybe in a den or a burrow, uh, making sure that they're gonna get the warmth. Sometimes they'll come out and like um, sun themselves, uh, but really they're just kind of hidden away. It's a really great time to go out and explore the desert um, when it's cool, so. Um, you don't have to worry about those poisonous snakes as much. And uh, right. sorry if you mentioned it and I missed it, uh, but what do we feed our cockroaches? Ah, that is a great question. So we do take care of our cockroaches very well and they get a very special diet. So they get a very special, um, it's a dog kibble. So it's kind of like a dog chow. Um, and so they do get the little dog chow to get all their vitamins and minerals. Um, but then every day they get fresh uh, produce. So we um, chop very thin slices of uh, sweet potatoes or yams, the orange ones. Um, and then they also get orange slices, very thin slices and apple slices. Um, those are the things that I see pretty regularly in there. Um, I'd have to check with our cockroach um, keeper to see if they get any um, thing other than that. Uh, but I know those are the ones that they get pretty regularly every day. Great. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so several of the animals we covered today um, are animals that people frequently have as pets. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to determine if they're a good pet for you, if any of them make good pets, and then um, if any of them are affected by the pet trade? Yes. Um, so that is always something that you want to have kind of in the back of your mind that any of the pets, you want to make sure they come from a responsible breeder um, and that they're not being pulled out of the wild. That is a very real um, challenge for a lot of the animals. Um, we uh, get our animals from other zoos um, or other facilities. So we know exactly where they're coming from, make sure they're very healthy. Uh, but you do want to do a lot of research to make sure that you can care for them. Some of the animals that we have in our ambassador um, uh, population, they can be very long lived. Um, so you have to be prepared to carry care for an animal from birth until life or whenever you accept them into your home uh, until their their life has um, kind of come to an end. So you need to be prepared to care for them for that whole time. You want to know how big the animal is going to get. You want to know how much it's going to eat. You also want to do a little bit of research on how much uh, medical um, costs, um, what's common for them. Can they get cancers? Can they get certain diseases? Do you need to vaccinate them? There's actually a lot of 
research um, and planning that should go into uh, when you're planning to get a pet. So that way you and that animal are gonna have a very high quality of life together um, for that whole time that you're with them. So those are very, very good questions. And we do all those things. So before we get an animal, we have to make sure that we can do and meet all those needs that that animal needs. Is it a social animal? Uh, what, what kind of heating does it need? What kind of natural environment uh, does it need? So we do a lot of research about like their natural habitats and their natural history. So we can get a little bit more information about the species, um, their characteristics, anything that they might need so that we can fully uh, care for them mentally, physically, um, emotionally, everything. Awesome, thank, thank you. you. Andrea. Um, for the bearded dragons, where in Australia are they naturally located? Do they tend to hang out on the grounds and trees? Um, where are you most likely to find them? So they actually live in a very diverse, uh, they can be found in a lot of different habitats. So you're gonna find them on the ground um, and they're mostly kind of on the, on the east side, on the east, on the eastern side, but they could really be found uh, in a in a variety of different habitats. So um, that's a really great thing about about the bearded dragons and some of the other species that we have is they come from a wide range. So they can be found in a desert, uh, but they can also be found in grasslands and woodlands. So they they're very um, opportunistic um, and they can take advantage of those different situations for them, um, which gives them a better survival. Um, than an animal that's a specialist that has to be in one specific kind of habitat. They can kind of um, diverge into those different spaces. Awesome, and then I think this is our last question. Uh, do ferrets cache their food? Well, that's a good question. Do ferrets cache their food? Um, I'm gonna step out of the way and maybe Sam is able to answer that one uh, about our ferrets. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen our ferrets cache their food um, um so uh, yeah So domestic ferrets do cache their food um, as far as, um, so like if you have a domestic ferret and if they find food things, they might actually, if you have them just running around in your house, they could actually cache food um, in your couches and all sorts of different, different hiding places. So some people do have ferrets as pets, but ferrets have a lot of energy and they can get into a lot of mischief. So they will actually cache food, they will cache earrings, they will cache all sorts of other fun things um, that might be in your home. Um, so that's kind of one of the things to think about if you ever were thinking about getting a domestic ferret as a pet is they um, they are very very intelligent and they need a lot of enrichment and enrichment at the zoo is what we call like um, it's kind of new and different things for them to be able to do so that they don't get bored and so that they always have something new and exciting to explore in their habitats um, and if your home is one of those habitats um, you need to be very careful because they're very curious animals in the wild um, they the black footed ferrets eat almost exclusively prairie dogs and actually they live in the prairie dog holes. So you saw our ferrets kind of moving around in their tunnels. Um, wild ferrets would move around in those prairie dog tunnels. And so prairie dogs are diurnal, meaning prairie dogs live during the day. Ferrets are nocturnal, meaning the ferrets um, are awake at night. So at night, the ferrets go down into those prairie dog holes um, and they find the sleeping prairie dogs and then they get a big meal. And the prairie dogs are actually usually larger than the ferrets are. Um, so the ferrets will stay down in those prairie dog dens and they'll um, they'll eat the prairie dogs that they were able to capture. And then they will actually live in the prairie dog dens as well. And the ferrets will actually have their kits in those prairie dog holes. And so they spend their whole lives kind of living with the prairie dogs. So they won't necessarily cache a prairie dog, um, but they will keep the prairie dog there and they can eat it for um, several days. Awesome. Um, I think that covered all of our questions, you guys. Um, thank you so much for presenting today, Andrea and Sam. You guys did a terrific job. Yeah. Um, and thank you guys so much for joining us. And just so you know, if you are interested in any of our educational programs, you can find us um, at readparkzoo.org. And you can even email us if you have any questions. You can email us at education at readparkzoo.org. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about our programs. And we would love to see you guys sometime. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, we will not have a Wild Wednesday next week in observance of Veterans Day, uh, but keep an eye on your email and we'll have an update about uh, future Wild Wednesdays after next week. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Thank you again, Andrea and Sam, and have a great rest of your day.